Well, this morning we're going to take another look at the teachings of Jesus through the parables. Um, and remember, we said we were going to just be looking at like overall themes of the parables rather than try to preach through all 40 or so of them. But the one thing that came to mind to me this week as I was preparing this is that we, we really should be thankful. I'm thinking of what we heard last week, the passage that Jesus quoted from Isaiah. We should be thankful that the, the Lord has given us ears to hear these parables and hear the meaning to comprehend them and to understand them. Because they truly are packed with just wonderful truths and profound divine wisdom. So it really is, uh, we should be thankful for that, that we're able to even just come upon these and to read them and to grasp them and, of course, apply them to our lives. Now, our survey this morning brings us to the 15th chapter of Luke, where we'll hear a set of parables that are very familiar to us. Um, This trio of parables falls into like a narrative category of parables. The six we heard last week, each one of them, if you recall, started off with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. So that's like, if you go back to your high school English, uh, that's what we would call a similitude. But this week's are narrative in nature. And there's sort of a, like, like a, a once upon a time literary um, illustration. And as lifelike as these parables are, It's good for us to keep in mind that they are indeed stories, stories drawn from real life circumstances. But like a movie, the characters are just that. They're characters in the storyline. We we find these parables grouped together in Luke's gospel for the same reason we saw the the parabolic grouping last week. Jesus uses all of them to, to illustrate a divine truth. And as we saw last week, and we'll see it again in this passage, this group is encapsulated in an inclusio. And you remember that's like that literary set of parentheses that wrap around a passage. So when you listen to the reading of this particular portion of scripture, listen particularly to verses one and two, and then at the end, when you hear the words of the older son in verses 28 through 30, that's where you'll see the inclusio. It's, it's good for us, you know, it's like we mention these things, like the, the, these, these sort of like mechanics of reading scripture. Well, we mention them because they help us to grasp the word of God just a little better each time. These, these, these tools, so to speak, are in there to help us to interpret scripture. So with all of that as our, as our intro, let's just dive right in. Um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. We heard, heard Everett read some of it earlier. I'm going to reread that and we'll read the, the whole chapter. Luke chapter 15. This is the, these are the words of Jesus as preserved for us in the Holy Scriptures. Luke 15, beginning in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 
When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word to our hearts today and may we see your truth that only you can illuminate for us through your spirit. And Father, give me the the, the strength to, to preach this sermon as you have laid it upon my heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first question I think we need to ask is why, why did Jesus tell these stories? Why would he teach these particular points at this particular time? And it's important for us to know that before digging into the passage because the passage is drawn out of that out of that purpose. And the answer is found actually in the first three verses. The tax collectors, who were Jews, who basically sold themselves out to serve Rome, they just went out collecting taxes for Rome, which was a very heavy tax burden to start with. But they would add a little more on top to line their own pockets. So basically, they were using extortion to rob from their own people in the name of Rome. So to say that they really weren't liked is an understatement. But they, along with sinners, as Luke puts it. Now, what I also found interesting is is how how Luke separates the tax collectors from the sinners. It's almost like he says they're a special kind of sinner. (laughs) But all of them together, tax collectors and sinners, we're told, were coming to Jesus. And not only to hear him, but they ate with him too. Sharing a meal with someone showed that you, you accepted them and you recognized them. And so Jesus here was not only hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, he was sharing meals with them too. So the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law, they, they grumbled about that. They couldn't believe it. I mean, how can he eat with sinners? But we don't get the impression here that they confronted Jesus with it. Instead, they just mumbled and they murmured under their breath, and looking at each other like, Can you believe this guy? He's actually eating with these people. He's hanging out with these people. Now, we spend a few minutes on that because the rest of the chapter, as I said before, is drawn from this. It's built upon this small but very important point. Because through these parables, Jesus responds to their mutterings. Now, remember, he didn't hear them say it, but he knew exactly what was on their hearts. He didn't have to hear them. But now the question is, why why would he do it? Why would Jesus even go into this? Well, we ask, why did Jesus come? Why did the Father send the Son? Luke 19.11 says this, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John 3.16 and 17, you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world 
to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So we see just through these three passages, these three verses, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Now rather than declare that point to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Jesus took the opportunity to teach a significant truth that not only explains why he was found among the sinners, but it also serves as an admonition against the leaders. But he received the tax collectors and sinners, and he preached the great love of God, which would draw mankind to himself through his great and very costly grace. But that's the point of this passage. Jesus is explaining the grace and mercy of God towards sinful mankind and showing that that is the basis of his ministry. Now, a couple of things about structure here is going to help us. First, that the parables, if you look at them, they, they're very similar, but they increase in intensity as they go. The first speaks of one sheep in a hundred. The second speaks of one coin in ten. And the last one speaks of one son out of two. The value of that which was lost increases significantly as this whole discourse unfolds. Secondly, the main characters are pretty diverse. He puts the Pharisees in the place of a shepherd. So we have a shepherd, we have a woman, and then we have a rich man with two sons. And that speaks of how, how God's love knows no boundaries, because all have sinned. There's no male or female, Jew or Gentile, or if we put it in our context today, no white, black, Hispanic, Asian, doesn't matter. All have sinned. And third, the, the first two parables will serve as a setup for the last one. I mean, they're very similar in form with, with some subtle differences. But the point of each of them provides the background for the story of what we call the prodigal son. Each one of them focuses on something or someone that is lost. But it's not like something that was simply misplaced. The Greek word here for lost in these passages is apollomy which literally means to be destroyed or to be killed or to be lost as in utterly perish. It's much like we, we use the term regarding how many lives were lost in a tragic event. So the lostness that Jesus employs in these parables implies the idea of complete and permanent loss. Jesus starts by saying, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Now he goes right to the Pharisees and right to the leaders and he compares them to shepherds. And this is by design. He's echoing the words of Ezekiel 34, which says this, should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You've ruled them harshly and brutally, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. That's what he's saying to them. So clearly, Jesus is indicting the leaders for not fulfilling their roles and caring for the flock. They were to be the shepherds who were to seek the lost who've wandered away. They were the ones to minister to those. And they were the ones that were to restore them back into the faith. Instead, they've created boundaries. They've turned away the lost, the tax collectors, the sinners. They've excluded the very ones Jesus sought out. Now, by the way, that, that is the imagery of the role of the pastor of the church, the shepherd, the flock, to feed the flock, to find them when they stray. That's where that comes from. Notice, too, that Jesus doesn't ascribe any sort of value to the sheep. He doesn't say whether, whether the sheep that was lost was a fattened sheep or he was skinny or it was older or it was younger or whether it was a male or it was a female. He just simply says it was one of the sheep, just like the rest. This shepherd in this parable would have gone after any one of the sheep. It didn't matter. And when the shepherd finds that lost one, he carries it back. He doesn't even make it walk back. He carries it back out of his compassion for the sheep. 
So this conjures up great joy in the shepherd, and he calls everyone he knows. He says, look, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. So clearly he was concerned for the lost one, and he sought after it until he found it, and he rejoiced. The woman and the coin story go the same way. The coin spoken of is, is, a, is a denarius or a drachma, and, and it's, it's probably the equivalent of a day's pay. And that society, losing a day's wages, would significantly hurt you. She has ten coins. They're all the same. And one goes missing. And it says she had to light a lamp, because the, the homes back then, they didn't have windows like we've got today. So it was dark. So she puts on a lamp... And to find something lost in that house was really hard because of it being dark. So the only way she could do it was to sweep the house, which really means she's sifting through dirt to find the coin. And she finds it. And she calls to her friends, rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. Something of value was lost, and it was as good as gone, but she found it. Now, both stories end the same way. It says, I tell you that there's more rejoicing in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Over one sinner. And Jesus adds another stinging indictment to the leaders when he says that that there's more rejoicing over one who repents over 99 righteous people who don't need to. It's almost, now you, you can picture this. It's almost like as Jesus is saying this, he's using air quotes, right? Oh, repents over 99 righteous people. <laughs> righteous people who don't need any, they don't need to repent. They're fine. All need to repent. (laughs) No one seeks after God. And Jesus is saying to them, even you Pharisees, you're all pious about yourselves. You too need to repent. I mean, listen to his words in Matthew 23. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. May those words never describe us as children of God. May we never, ever become like Pharisees. Now, the point here in these two parables is that God's desire... God's desire is that none should perish and that his son's ministry is to go and find the lost. And each one of them is just as valuable, just as cherished, just as loved by God as all the others. And it brings great joy in the heavenlies when one lost soul turns to God in repentance. When one, one lost soul is found. These two stories... Now, if you think about it, they kind of speak in the abstract, right? It's a story of a lost sheep and a story of a lost coin. But now the Lord brings it into a real-life analogy. A father with two sons. And and there's a lot in this parable. We could probably do a whole series on this parable alone. But we're looking for for the point that ties all three of them together. So there is a relationship between the two sons. It's a classic sibling rivalry. And it's much like Jacob and Esau, where a blessing was manipulated. There's a relationship between the father and his two sons. And he clearly, as we read through it, he clearly loves them both. And there's also the way in which the younger squandered his inheritance to the point of of having to serve as a pig herder. Certainly an occupation that was absolutely abhorrent to Jewish people. So that shows us that, that... the character of the younger son was, was, could represent somebody who's indifferent to the idea of holiness, or maybe that he fell into utter desperation, or maybe both. But in essence, the younger now became a slave. And then there's the way the older son rebukes his father. And you can hear the disdain in his voice, this son of yours, you've done nothing for me, but you do all of this for him. But when we look at this in the context of the other two parables, and in the, this is the Lord's response to the grumbling thoughts of the leaders, Jesus is teaching here that he is here to save, to seek and save the lost, and that when a sinner repents and turns to the Lord, there is great rejoicing. Now, what does the younger son do when he, hit, he, hit, he hits bottom? He comes to his senses. He came to himself. He woke up. His heart is convicted 
of his wrongdoing. And he's living in the consequences of wrongdoing was the way he treated his father. And he saw that apart from his father, he was lost. His father believed him to be lost too, in in the sense of having perished. Like the shepherd looking for the lost sheep. Like the woman looking for the lost coin. But the son has a change of heart. A change of mind. We call that repentance. And he returned to his father with a well-rehearsed apology. He knew his sin and he was seeking restoration. Jesus tells us that the father saw the younger one coming from a distance. Implying that every day he was in those fields, he was always looking. He was always seeking. Seeking the younger son. And in his joy, in his utter jubilation, the father ran to the son. Now, this was actually an act of humiliation. In that culture, older men wore wore longer robes, and the only way to run would be to lift the robes up. It was an act that was socially unacceptable, and it was shameful for elderly men to do that. But the father does that. He ignores all the shame and humiliation, and he runs to greet his son. He doesn't chastise him or reprimand him. He doesn't insist on retribution. Instead, he embraces him. He embraces him. When the father hears the son go into his rehearsed confession, he cuts him off. He doesn't even let him finish it. Instead, he calls, quick, get the robe, get the finest robe, get a ring, and get sandals for him. Now, the robe was a mark of distinction and we see that in Genesis 41 when Pharaoh installed Joseph and he gave him a robe. The ring is a symbol of authority and you can see that in Esther when the king gave Mordecai his signet ring. And sandals would set him apart from the servants who wore no foot coverings. And all the friends were called to join in a great celebration and feast just as in heaven there's great rejoicing when one sinner returns to God. The depth of the love of the father here is great. Before he hears a word from the boy, he runs to him and he embraces him. The one he thought was lost, never to be seen again, as good as dead, is found. What joy. What a reunion. What genuine love. And he forgives him. And not in word, but in action. He's restored him. He's restored the boy. Dare we say he's elevated him. The robe, the ring, the sandals. And then there's this great, great celebration and a great feast and great rejoicing. Now, if this story had ended here, we would see all the parallels between the first two and this one, and we would conclude that when something or someone is lost, there's cause for great joy. And it would be easy to identify the Father with our loving Heavenly Father, and see as the prodigal, prodigal, see us as the prodigal who's welcomed back. But Jesus continues the parable, and he includes the older brother at the end. Now, what about the older brother? We sometimes read this parable, and maybe we can't believe how indignant the, the older brother was. He's working in the field when the party starts. What's going on? And he's told your brother's returned, and your father's celebrating. Come, come join the party. And he refuses. He gets angry instead. And his father comes out looking for him, looking for him, seeking him out. Where's my other son? And he asks him, he pleads with him, come, come join the celebration. But the, the exchange doesn't really go that well. The older son looks at him and goes, he took your money. He blew it on wild living and prostitutes and I stayed here and worked for you. It's as if he's saying, you've got to be kidding me. He swindled you for his inheritance. He blew it, and he comes back, and you throw him a big party? What about me? Sounds a lot like the Pharisees and the teachers that Jesus is responding to. And there is the inclusio. But the father says, you've been here with me all along. But your brother was was dead. And now he's alive. (laughs) He was lost. And now he's found. 
And that's how it ends. So the parable, it's left open. And I think for good reason. The open ending leads the hearer to think. You've got to think about this now. What would you do if you were the brother, the older brother? Would you say, hey, 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 that's great. I'll be right there. Can't wait to see him. You wouldn't. Come on, be honest. You wouldn't. <laughs> You'd be just as indignant as the older brother here. But in the context of the grumbling of the Pharisees, Jesus is clearly showing them that he was sent by the Father to seek and save the lost. Those who are lost. Those who are spiritually lost apart from God. He came to bring them the message of reconciliation with God, which he would complete on the cross. He came to draw the lost back to God for them to repent. And for those that do repent, there's a great celebration because those folks were indeed spiritually dead. And that's how it works with God. But the message is to the leaders who, of all people, should have had a desire to see the lost redeemed and made right with God. The leaders knew the scriptures. They were in that position. They were in a position to lead the flock, to protect the flock, to nurture the flock, and to find the strays and bring them back. But because of their hardened hearts, they didn't see the overwhelming value of each individual soul. They didn't see that social status doesn't mean anything to God. They saw them as low-life, sell-out tax collectors and sinners who they, the leaders, deemed not worthy of forgiveness. And so this, this whole exchange truly is a rebuke on them. But it's also a rebuke on anyone who would be like them, a rebuke on anyone who would become legalistic, one who would think you have to do things, a rebuke on anyone who would have the audacity to decide who's worth seeking and who isn't, a rebuke on those who don't see the joy of a heart turning to God. So for us today, then, so what does this all tell us? Well, in many ways, we're like the prodigal. I think we can all see that in ourselves. I mean, I mean, think about it. It's kind of how it worked for each and every one of us. I mean, think back to the time of your second birth. You realized the gravity of your hopeless situation before God. And you realized you could do nothing to resolve the sin problem between you and God. It's like being dead. What can I do? You're just like the, the, the men that responded to Peter's sermon. What can I do? You realized you came to your heavenly father somehow and you had to plead for mercy. And you did what Peter exhorted those who heard his first sermon. He said, repent, repent. So you turn to the living God and you receive the mercy of God by the substitutionary suffering of Jesus on the cross. And that alone stands as a demonstration of his great love for you. A love deeper than any one of us can begin to fathom. And you were born again. You were quickened from death to life by the Holy Spirit. And then the way you viewed sin changed. At the same time, we should prayerfully examine our hearts and ask ourselves, do we act like the Pharisees and the leaders and the older son? Do we stand as judge and jury on God's behalf? Do we automatically exclude certain people from the gospel? Do we realize that lost souls are just that? They're lost souls, as good as dead. I would argue that most of the names we hear prayed for every Sunday morning are lost souls. We should be praying for them, always, because they're as good as dead. The gospel message is indeed for everyone there's no distinction. The gospel message is a message of life. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has, listen, crossed over from death to life. 
And Paul picked it up in Ephesians 2, and he kind of pulls it together. He says, but because of his great love for us, because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We're all sinners, but now we're called saints. Saints through the work of Christ. Jesus also shows that whoever hears these parables that lost souls grieve the Lord. Jesus came to seek them. Jesus came to suffer for them. Jesus came to conquer sin and death for them. Jesus rose again to give them hope and assurance of eternity just like he did for you. Jesus, the good shepherd, will go and find the lost and carry them on his shoulders back into the safety of the sheep pen. Jesus left the holy purity of heaven to come to earth and literally get his hands dirty, sifting through the dirt to find the lost coin that is the valuable soul. Jesus set the humiliation and shame of the cross aside and he had his robe removed so that he could embrace the repentant sinner, offering forgiveness and restoration in the kingdom of God. And we thank God Almighty because out of his great love for us, he sent his son who sought each and every believer sitting in this church today and carried you back on his shoulders. May we heed the lesson of Jesus Christ through these parables. May we not be like the grumbling son or the Pharisees. May we not take it upon ourselves to decide who should be saved. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. May we never forget the words that say, such were some of you. Before we were found by the good shepherd, such were some of us. And may our hearts have the same attitude as Jesus when it comes to the lost. In Romans 6, we're told, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So may may the Lord speak the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ through us and into the hearts of all the lost. May they repent May they repent, and may they turn to the living God and enter into new life in Christ. And may that be our prayer, always, always. And above all, may our heart's desire be to join with the angels in heaven who rejoice when one sinner repents. Because the same thing happened when we first believed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you that Jesus came and sought us out. We thank you that you sought us, you saved us, you've redeemed us, and now you call us saints. <laughs> so Lord, may we, may we see everything you've taught in this parable, the, the incredibly deep love of the Father for the lost sheep the way you embrace the lost that come to you in heartfelt repentance. It's a love we'll never understand. It's a love demonstrated on the cross because without the cross, we wouldn't know you. We would be remaining dead in our sins. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your heart and your grace and what you did for us. And may we have hearts like yours, where our souls and our hearts break for those who are lost. And we pray for them. We plead with them. And may you save them, and may there be rejoicing in heaven when it happens. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.